Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Why No One Place. We're going to head back into the bot lane for this one and talk about someone who might just be one of the most polarizing ADCs in the game. And that's saying a lot, considering bot laners come and go all the time. But I say with all certainty that this guy is straight up either turbo pick ban or non-existent. So let's go ahead and discuss the champion who people always think I'm referring to myself when I say his name. Varus, the Arrow of Retribution. Varus, 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 whatever. I'll just call him Varus. There was a memo, Varus. There was a memo! The bot lane, and by extension the Marksman class, follow a very typical pattern of behavior. You often have two or three champions that rotate in and out at any given point in time based on who was recently buffed. It could be Jinx, Draven, Vayne, Tristana, Caitlyn, Twitch, Kaisa, Samita, Misfortune, what have you. Of course, there are staple picks like Ezreal and Jin, but that's sort of how the meta works down there. It's not like top jungle and mid where there's a handful of strong options. Down there, you tend to run into whoever is really strong at the moment, like for the majority of Season 11, Jinx took the top spot as the most widely played ADC. In 2017, that title used to belong to Tristana. Regardless, after they enjoy a few months of notoriety, Riot hits all the popular marksmen with nerfs, while trying to get a different group thrusted back into the spotlight. However, there's a subset of ADCs that rarely get that moment in the limelight, or if they do, it's for much less time or it's not as significant. The Utility Marksmen, Sivir, Ash, and Varus. These three are considered Utility Marksmen on account of having a different playstyle than their peers. Instead of shooting anything that moves, they try to influence the game through other ways, such as a strong neutral game and supportive abilities. Despite being effective in the right circumstances, you don't run into them all that frequently. They're usually seen as boring or monotonous to play, not exactly the same kind of explosive carry potential as the solo queue demons that normally terrorize bot lane. But even among utility marksmen, Varus is played the least, though he's definitely had moments where everyone and their mothers played him back in like 2017 and 2018. That said, his normal play rate may just be one of the worst of its kind, on the same level as Callista and Kog'Ma. Then again, we do see him a lot in pro play, which is often the reason why he never seems to be able to get a chance to show up in solo queue. In a similar fashion to Azir and Ryze, anytime Riot gives Varus attention, his presence in the competitive scene dials up to 11. Utility marksmen see more liberal use in pro play because the need for damage isn't so high, and any team benefiting attributes are prioritized since it's not 5 individuals against 5 individuals, it's one team against another. And so, their collective strength is judged over their solo use ability. Though that doesn't mean a team-focused champion can't survive in solo queue. Were that the case, the support role wouldn't even exist. There's something within their design, or playstyle, that gets suppressed by the more fast-paced chaotic everyman-for-himself environment that is solo queue. For Ryze and Azir, their main problem is that they simply don't have enough time to reach their power spikes. Given how obscenely disgusting they get in the late game, their early games have to be abysmal, forcing the player to be patient and farm it out until that point. As for Varus, the reasons are a bit different. It's not merely because he's strong in pro play that hampers his usage. It does play a large role, but there's something fundamentally broken about him that honestly warrants a rework in my opinion. His gameplay. Varus has two mutually exclusive playstyles, Long Range Poke and DPS. Sadly, those two aren't conducive to each other in any way. If you want to itemize for strong poke damage, your DPS will lag behind and vice versa. Should you play on hit Varus, you're not going to get much damage out of your Q and E. Here's the problem, Varus's power balance is split a lot more than that of other marksmen with dual purposes. So you basically have a champ who can only ever play at like 80% of his actual power. Let's look through his kit to better explain what I mean. First, we have Living Vengeance, which grants him a sizable and long-lasting attack speed buff whenever he kills a unit, increased against enemy champions. Since he gets more attack speed based on his bonus attack speed, if you go for a standard DPS build, you can get like 80-100% to bonus attack speed in the late game. It's pretty serious business. Then we have his infamous Piercing Arrow, which as you can guess, is a Piercing Arrow that increases in range and power the longer he charges it for. When fully charged, it does a huge amount of damage, and with a max range of almost 1600, it's one of the best abilities to use in the neutral. Already though, it's pretty obvious that we have a bit of a disconnection. His passive and Q don't work off each other at all. Living Vengeance incentivizes you to attack as rapidly as possible, especially after you get a kill, sort of like Jinx's passive Get Excited. It's very momentum based. Piercing Arrow, on the other hand, encourages you to stay far back and chuck poke damage at your opponents. But okay, maybe it's just a one-off thing. Lots of champions have that one ability in their kit that kinda sticks out like a sore thumb. Let's keep going. So we're gonna skip his W for a moment and go to his E next. Hail of Arrows is a mid-range attack that deals damage to all enemies in a circle, and anyone who's still in that circle is slowed and hit with 40% Grievous Wounds. Varus is one of the rare few with built-in Grievous Wounds, which is pretty nice, what with all the rampy healing going on. He doesn't have to waste 800 gold on an early Executioner's. Okay, so this ability also doesn't have any ties to his passive. What gives? Why does he have a Q and E you would see on a caster marksman but a passive suited for a DPS one? That's where Blighted Quiver comes into play. It has two properties, a passive and an active. 
First passive, Vars deals bonus magic damage on hit, applying stacks of blight with each attack. His damaging abilities deal bonus max health damage based on the amount of blight stacks they had while refunding the cooldowns of his basic abilities by up to 36%. Okay, now we have some semblance of internal synergy. With this in mind, you can make the conclusion that Varus is supposed to hit someone a few times, then use either Q or E as a finisher. Not the first time we've seen this, Gwen has a similar function on Snip Snip. Attack a few times to charge up her Q, then use it for big damage. The active component further sells that by imbuing his next piercing arrow to do bonus missing health damage. So he can do both max health and missing health on top of the huge damage on his base Q. And that makes for a rather powerful ability, wouldn't you say? Finally, we have Chain of Corruption, which not only applies full stacks of blight to anyone hit by it, but is a long-range 2-second root that can root other targets nearby. It's almost a super ultimate. Almost. Not quite. Based on his abilities, there appears to be a clear win condition. Get blight stacks and detonate them with either Q or E. So then what's the matter here? Varus's kit does have internal synergy, but if you remember what I wrote for Problem 1, it said he had two different playstyles. In theory, it seems pretty obvious what you should do on him. Get a few auto attacks in and finish him off with your Q. But Piercing Arrow and even Hail of Arrows were not designed to be used as a finisher type attack. They're neutral abilities. They function at their strongest when nothing is happening, when Varus is allowed to spam them over and over again to chip away at the enemy team. It can be used as a finisher, but that's not what it's best known for. Now let's flip it around and look at his AP slash DPS build. Living Vengeance is a scaling attack speed steroid and arguably one of the best in terms of sheer stats. Thanks to Blighted Quiver's on hit magic damage, you can reasonably find success with AP Varus. At 3 stacks of Blight, you get 7.5% bonus max health damage per 100 ability power. Seeing as a typical AP build gets you around 5 to 600, a full power W can do up to like 60% max health in a single hit. But if you select that direction, Hail of Arrows and Piercing Arrow are essentially out of the picture. Having two separate win conditions that don't work off each other efficiently makes her a character you can only experience a portion of at any point in time. There's never a situation when you can fully capitalize on both his long range poke damage and AP burst slash DPS. You can try to, but at that point you might as well play another champion, which is what most players do. Unlike other champions with alternative playstyles, Varus takes half his power budget for one and half for the other. An example of a champion who does this better is Kai'Sa. Building standard DPS with attack damage and attack speed means you can trigger caustic wounds faster, making up for the lack of ability power with increased frequency of procking it. The Cathian Rain, Void Seeker, and Killer Instinct also have AD scaling. A lot of AD scaling. If you choose ability power, you may not deal a whole lot of damage per auto attack, but Void Seeker and Caustic Wounds will sting a lot more, giving you that burst element. Even so, you can still improve the power of her Q and Ultimate. Kaisa can fight at 100% efficiency with either build path due to her kit intertwining the two playstyles together. It also does help that both basic attacks and her W detonate plasma stacks, whereas Varus can only set off Blight with an ability and not just with autos. So then, why not give Varus AD ratios on W and Ultimate and AP ratios on Q and E? Simple. That's a terrible idea. Out of all utility marksmen within League, he has the best neutral game bar none. Unlike Ash, whose volley isn't known for his damage output, you cannot ignore Varus' damage. Said neutral game is enhanced further by the psychological threat of his ultimate. Because his effective range is so high, any form of pressure you give him will be all the more dangerous. There's a point in time when Piercing Arrow's base cooldown at rank 5 was only 8 seconds, with 40% cooldown reduction that went down to 4.8. Every 5 seconds, this man could nail you with a long-range missile that does like 700 damage with 2 items. Two of those, and he could snipe out squishy opponents without them being able to do anything. That's why his kit is designed the way it is. Let's go back to the Kaisa comparison. Void Seeker does a ton of damage, has semi-global range, and refunds almost all its cooldown if it hits an enemy champion. But it travels slower and strikes only one target. Piercing Arrow can hit multiple, at reduced damage mind you, but you can't really hide behind your tanky support or top laner. Furthermore, Chain of Corruption is one of the best teamfight ultimates a marksman can have. Not only does it root the first champion hit for 2 seconds, but it singles them out too. Any nearby enemy champions have 2 seconds to get far away from the primary target lest they get rooted for the same time. Depending on the situation, Chain of Corruption can be more devastating than Ash's Crystal Arrow. Even if you get hit by a max stun ultimate, your teammates can step in to protect you from any follow-up attacks. But if you get hit with a Varus Chain, there is a much lower chance your team will feel like protecting you, as if they do, they get punished for it. Varus's Q and Ultimate are some of the best individual abilities to have on an AD carry. A penetrating attack that goes as far as 1600 units and an almost equally long range 2 second route that isolates you from the safety of your allies. If you give him any more than that, he would become too oppressive to go up against. This is where the balance dilemma comes into play though. Those two abilities are not enough to solo carry his egregious weaknesses. He's a marksman with a terrible disadvantage state, one of the easiest champions to wipe off the face of the map for an assassin. 
He doesn't have a good trade combo like some other marksmen, and even if you do build attack speed and whatnot, he will always be second rate to a traditional crit marksman like Jinx or Twitch. His neutral game is exceptional, but his damage output really isn't. It's not like Ezreal who can pelt you over and over with Qs. Piercing Arrow hurts like a motherfucker, but he needs a lot of free time for it to be effective. A strong neutral game only means the champion is at their most powerful when nothing is happening, and that's exactly where Varus becomes a threat. What this means is that he's kind of hard to play well in the solo queue landscape since solo queue has about half as much neutral game as pro play. There's always something happening, and all popular champions thrive in high octane scenarios. Lots of champions with rushdown and bulldozer playstyles, like divers, juggernauts, assassins, and skirmishers. Most of the time, he's going to be staring down an enemy team comp that won't let him comfortably do his job. His worst thing popularity is mainly a result of the way League is evolving. Things just happen at a faster rate, fights break out a lot more easily, and they end much faster. Everyone plays hyper-aggressive champions in solo queue, and we're actually starting to see pro play shift in this direction as well. Gone are the days where you can go 5 minutes without getting a kill. Now you pretty much have 1 or 2 kills per minute, maybe even more. Unless you have a team explicitly designed to force a neutral game, Varus won't really have many opportunities to do what he does best. What's the team composition that forces neutral, you ask? Any combination of 5 champions with very strong poke damage, zone control, and or disengage. So hypothetically, Gangplank top, Jungle Nidalee, Vagar mid, Jin bot, and Zerath support. A comp like this would be able to exert so much pressure on the enemy team from a far distance. If you walk up even a little, you'll get trapped inside Vagar's cage and wasted within seconds. Triple global ultimates, ridiculous poke damage, easy long range pick potential, etc. Another team composition could be Alawi top, Ivern jungle, Malzahar mid, Varus bot, and Janus support. This one doesn't have the same amount of aggressive pressure as the first, but to all you Katarina one tricks watching, does that look like an enemy team with your name on it? I didn't think so. How often do you have these types of compositions though? Not very often, and even if you do, there are many other options with passable neutral games. Perhaps not as good as Varus, but adequate enough to get the job done. Caitlyn doesn't have the same range as him, but she can set up traps to zone off enemies and do more consistent damage the moment a fight does break out. Ezreal doesn't hurt as much with a single Q, but he makes up for it with quantity over quality. Ultimately, Varus is only good when the game progresses slow and steady, which understandably is boring to play and watch. Playing him is also objectively boring. Most of the time you're slinging Qs and Es and waiting for some idiot on the enemy team to walk up too far so you can ult them. It's the same sort of reason why Ash and Sivir don't see much play either. To their credit, due to how easy they are to pick up, they're a very safe choice for when you're autofilled. But over the years, we've seen newer marksmen introduced who are not only easy to pick up, but more fun to play. One such addition was Jin. He's got the same long range pressure while also being easy to learn. Harder to master of course, but you don't have to learn how to attack move or kite opponents with fancy mechanics. Not only that, but mages have become socially acceptable down in the bot lane as well, namely Ziggs. As far as strength in the neutral is concerned, few can hold a candle to this guy. You forfeit the pick potential from Chain of Corruption, but you have way more damage. Without question, Ziggs is infinitely better than Varus in terms of pressure from a distance. Can there be anything to make him more popular without being seen as boring or frustrating to play against? No, not really. Unlike mages who can express their magic powers in their own special ways, AD carries are supposed to just auto-attack at the end of the day. If you notice, every new Marston that came out since Callista has some really weird-ass gimmick or playstyle. Callista herself jumps around a lot and racks up spears. Jin hits you with power instead of speed. Zaya has her own interactions with her feathers. Sen is kind of like Jin and also support. Aphelios has five different weapons. Samira is a marksman, but she plays more like a 1v9 diver. Akshan is a hybrid between marksman and assassin, and Zeri's auto-attack is her Q. Older marksmen all look more or less the same. They have a damaging ability, a dash or utility spell, and some form of damage amplification or something that boosts their combat pressure. Very cookie cutter. And many of them are failing to withstand the test of time. As sad as it sounds, Varus is gonna die. His situation will only get worse and worse from here on out. And there's no way Riot can do anything about it unless they rework him. But if they rework him, they'll likely have to pull an Aatrox and completely reimagine the guy, which defeats the purpose of trying to fix him. You're just making a brand new champion at that point. Maybe I'm just being pessimistic about it though. What do you guys think? Do you believe something can be done for Vars? Let me know in the comments down below. That's gonna be it for today though, so if you enjoyed the video, please be sure to leave a like and subscribe. Consider following me on Twitter, joining my Discord server, and checking out my previous Why No One Plays episodes after this one. But until next time, thank you all so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.